Good morning and welcome. My name is Arden Thomas. Uh, the name of this presentation is Multicore Playground. It talks a little bit about some thinking about and some research we're doing about how we can get uh, the most of uh, out of modern CPUs. Um, I'm the product manager for Syncom Small Talk, and I mentioned yesterday at lunch one of the one of my responsibilities is to keep moving our, our products, moving them ahead, keep moving them forward, uh, put useful things in them, and put in things that, that are, are truly useful for our customers. So I think this represents some, some exciting work and, and direction for where we're going. So first, multi-core computers. T today, uh, it's pretty, pretty difficult to buy a powerful computer without it being multi-core. Even, uh, even the netbooks are starting to be uh, dual-core dual core computers. Um, quad cores, uh, the machine I have right here is a dual core. My machine at home is a, is a the desktop is a, is a quad core. And we know 8, 16, 64, uh, I'm sure will be coming right around the corner. So they're becoming prevalent, they're becoming commonplace. Things. Did I mention moving the product forward? And we always have a roadmap of things we're working on for the future and, and things beyond that in the future. And when researching ways to leverage multi core was put on the roadmap, that got a lot of interest from, from our customers and the community. People wanted to, wanted to hear more about this. So, so the item was very attractive. People said, Tell me more about that. So we've been doing some of that, and we'll even have something, which I'll discuss later in the presentation, uh, coming out with, with our, our next release with Visual Work 7.7. So, so what's the attraction? Well, part of the attraction is simply to make the best use of what you have. We can see a task manager here. And you may be running an application and maxing out one core, and maybe you've got three more cores sitting there idle. And maybe you can drop your throughput, you can drop your, your time a whole lot by, by making better use of the resources that, that you have. So this starts to explore what we can do about that. Some years ago, I was. I was I got to hear a, um, a presentation by a woman named Grace Marie Hopper. And she was one of the very early computer scientists. And she was literally there when one of the old computers where they actually had mechanical relays. And then there was a model relay. And the control center was calling saying, you know, what's, what's the hold up? And they said, we're, we're getting the bugs out of the computer. And it was a literal, a literal bug they were getting out of the computer, which is kind of the, the origins of that term. But the one thing that she had that was really interesting, listening to her presentations, what was a way to convey ideas. Uh, for example, she discussed uh, a nanosecond. What's a nanosecond? And she used to give out pieces of wire, I think they were around this long, that represented how long it would take for an electrical signal to travel in one nanosecond. It was a great way to convey that idea. But the reason I bring her up, I remember one thing that she said in her presentation. So when a farmer was out in the field, he was, he was pulling out a stump out of the ground with a horse, and the single horse could not do it. He, he didn't go back to the barn for a bigger horse. He went back for another horse, or a team of horses. So, so what she was trying to do was saying for the future of computing that uh, you know, using multiple computers or what we have today with multiple computers would be in the way of the future. And we needed to continue researching how to use that team of horses. So actually a, a multi-core CPU is, is then like a team of horses. And the way we can make use of that is it is by some type of concurrent programming. And it's, it's very similar to uh, programming on multiple <coughs> machines, ex 
except on, on a multi-core machine, you maybe have a few more options available. You wouldn't if they were if they were disparate machines. And that is, you probably have generally faster communication within the machine, and you have other options available to you, like using shared memory, etc., because you're on the same machine. So one of the one of the key things to note, though, is doing concurrency is is not trivial. It's not easy. It's pretty much a problem that people have attempted to for uh, as soon as we had two computers, people started thinking about how to harness the power of both of them to attack a, a single problem. So it's a difficult problem. It's been studied for decades. There, there's some solutions out there, certainly. There's very poor solutions, and there's okay solutions. Um, there's an intrinsic level of added difficulty usually, almost no matter what you do. So it's, it's not a simple, trivial problem. And again, there's, there's better and worse solutions out there today. So one of the things that in researching for this, uh, for this paper and some of the work, I noted that both AMD and Intel have both coordinated money and people to universities to basically you know, study concurrency research. And why would they be doing this? Well, it's, it's pretty straightforward. They're producing multi-core CPUs, so if they can move the state of the art forward to better harness multi-core CPUs, they, they may help create more demand for the products that they sell. So it makes sense, but it also underscores that it's not like a solved problem, and lots more work can be done to better harness these new products that they're building. Another quote that is very appropriate, and if you've done any work with multiprocessing, concurrency work, is that as the power of using that concurrency grows linearly, the complexity grows exponentially. And that's why the type of a small matter of programming, it's, it's, it's not a simple or trivial thing. Um, same with distributed systems. As the power of using that grows linearly, the complexity grows exponentially. Um, if you've done even any even very trivial types of applications, say, uh, having producer and consumer processes uh, running against some type of shared collection. And, and you can run into subtleties and bugs that have you scratch in your head and, and some of them, even some very simple errors, can be very difficult to diagnose and, and figure out what's gone wrong. And, and of course, if you're scaling up to something very complex that's even difficult to understand, trying to uh, troubleshooting some of those difficulties can be extremely difficult. So what I want to do is discuss what, what, what might be some approaches to that we can use to leverage multi-core. How might we approach the problem? And we'll discuss a few, a few simple ways and, and, and explore one of them in, in, in some depth. So the first way we can exploit multi-cores on a CPU is to run multiple applications and simply let the operating system do the scheduling work and, and try to keep all the cores busy and, and, and productive. So the advantage of this is it's, it's, it's really easy. There's not much you need to do at all except to run multiple applications and, and most of us do that on our on our computers every day. That's simple, easy, effective, probably very minimal contention, maybe just some for the, for the hard drive on the computer. Uh, the disadvantages might be well, we need, we need those multiple applications, and they may or may not be, they may or may not be using those multiple applications to, to attack a single problem. It might be more difficult to do. <coughs> Another approach. Another approach that we could use is to have multiple process threads in a single application. And so, 
So we can have one application running and, and basically work respond multiple threads. And, and this has a number of advantages. Those threads can be used to address the same, the same set of objects, the same object space. So you can be using multiple cores to work concurrently on the same group of objects. And that can, that can be very attractive. It can be very effective. But, but with that power comes uh, certainly some responsibility, certainly some overhead, because now we have to manage contention to those objects. And whenever you have to manage that, there's going to be a certain level of, of overhead that you're going to be paying for that. Um, also, usually there's significant added complexity with, with just managing that, um, in, in, especially in, in the code. Uh, one other possible drawback is that if you're running a native thread and something goes horribly wrong, it can end up taking down uh, the entire application, less, less tolerant. Uh, one thing to note, uh, we have in our VisualWorks product and Object Studio product, we don't have native threads, but we have green threads, which, which are, are non-native threads, essentially. And interesting, and I'll discuss this in some more detail later, it was actually almost a little surprising for, for the application, that I found them remarkably effective for one particular problem. Where, where they, they worked out fantastically, and probably in this case, even, even better than using native threads. So having something like a, a green thread facility may, may still be very useful. Digress just a moment. If you've done some uh, some of this type of work in, in visual works, some of the objects that are available there for concurrency are you can fork off processes, uh, semaphores, there's things. There's a, a promise object, which is, which is a kind of, of future. Um, there is shared queue, which is an essentially a, a thread safe collection. So if you're doing a, a very simple or traditional uh, producer consumer problem, you could run multiple producer processes. They could add things to a shared queue, uh, which would manage uh, orderly access to that to that collection. And then you could also run multiple uh, consumer processes, which would, in a thread safe manner, remove things from that queue and, and process them. What else can we do for? What other approaches might we take for? or leveraging that support. Well, and I want to point out this is this isn't this is just some, some speculation on my part. Not anything we're particularly working on. But what if we ran multiple process threads in the VM? What if we had one thread to as an execution thread, another thread just to do garbage collection, another thread just to do our, our, our JIT work? What would be some of the advantages and disadvantages of that? Well, one of the biggest advantages is that even in a, a single threaded application, you could use multiple cores. Um, I, I discussed this with some, uh, some of our engineers and some engineers out in the community. Uh, some felt that this, this approach it sounded interesting, but probably the contention, the contention between these, these three threads in the VM, there might be so much contention it might pretty much mitigate all the advantages that you might get in this type of scenario. I suppose that would be some, some research work that could be done. But probably very very expensive research because you pretty much need to build a, a VM to work in this, in this fashion. If you took something like a, a significantly sized VM with, with complexity, it, this might be a, a very difficult and long-term project to, to try to do, and, and even questionable advantages to whether this would be beneficial at all. What else? It's another approach. Another approach we can take is to run <coughs> multiple applications that were coordinated. So, for example, if you were running 
multiple small talk images, and they were communicating with each other. So maybe you had the, the top one there was kind of the the, uh, the master the master image, and it's it's uh, doling out some more to a number of other images. You could use multiple cores to to attack uh, to attack one problem. Uh, this has advantages and disadvantages. Uh, one of the advantages is you could probably get away with relatively small changes to your code to use this. Uh, hopefully, if done correctly, it could be pretty easy to do, pretty effective. Uh, it could be scaled, scaled to probably almost any number of cores. Uh, probably fewer contention issues. And you can do it without making the any VM changes, for example. Some disadvantages is that this would work out very well for certain problems and not well at all for other types of problems. So for a subset of problems, this, this would work great. Others, not so well, inappropriate. One more approach that we could take, and this is kind of a variation of the last one, is that you could have coordinated multiple applications that could access the same shared memory. So, you mean the vault of memory or some other buffer? Oh, just the, the memory on the, on, the, on, the, on that machine. So, say the allocate memory that, that all the applications can, can access and share. But the object memory or some other? Right, it would be a shared object memory. Okay. Yeah. So the advantages of, of this would be that you could use those multiple cores to, to address the same object set. So again, like the, like the multiple threads in, in the other example, you could use multiple cores to concurrently work on the same group of objects, which is, which is one, one class of, of problem, one class of, of usefulness. So you have to bring multiple cores to bear on, on, on the same object set. The disadvantages, I mean, this would be, it starts to get into much more complexity than the last one. Uh, first, you have to think about how, how do I manage that object space? Because now, basically, I have a distributed garbage collection problem. And it's a, so it, it, as the, the usefulness grows linearly, the complexity grows exponentially. This is a good example of that. You'd also need to, to manage the shared access to those to those shared objects. So, so no matter what, you're going to have some overhead and complexity and, and overhead for, for managing that concurrency, shared set of objects. So I wanted to move us forward with this. And I wanted to start to look into, into how might we through our, our Syncom Smalltalk products, better utilize multi-core CPUs. And, and I push to have this, this research put, put on our roadmap. And I mean, there, there was even some reluctance, yeah. I think, you know, with engineering management, because it was like, you know, asking them to solve concurrency was, was like asking them to cure cancer. Mm -hmm. But you have many months. <laughs> So, so they were a little bit reluctant to do that, but, but luckily we had some, some engineers who, who, who had some really, really good ideas. And they started to do some work. Well, what, what were some of the requirements? And what do we want? Well, if we consider one of the fantastic things about small talk, one of the things that makes small talk so powerful to use, is that if you consider that, that we have say, this much capacity to do development work. So, so we, we have this much total capacity. And the language we choose is going to take up some of this bandwidth that we have to work on problems. So if we choose a very difficult language, we might be using a significant amount of the overall capacity we have to, to work on problems. Oh. As I see, one of the biggest advantages with small talk is that small talk adds very little to the stack and gives you a whole lot of bandwidth 
to deal with solving your business problems, solving your scientific problems, solving whatever problem it is you're trying to work at. Small talk is also effective when doing concurrency. Why? Well, concurrency can be very complex. It can take up a lot of the space. The great thing about small talk is it, it doesn't take up much of this, so it gives us plenty of capacity to deal with, you know, say, say our, our concurrency takes up this month because it's very difficult, very complex, very hard to work with. Well, small talk is good, but, but now we've used up a lot of our stack for doing that. And that removes one of the biggest advantages, I think, for using small talk in the first place. So what I would rather have, I would rather have something small talk simple. Something that just adds a little to the stack, it's not too difficult to use, but hopefully is very effective. So now we have small talk, and we're able to do some type of concurrency, and we still have plenty of bandwidth to really solve those difficult problems that that, that usually makes small talk shine because other projects, the, the complexity grows so much, they just fail because they've used up too much of this bandwidth. They don't have enough left to solve some very difficult problems. That's what I really want is, is a small talk, simple way of approaching, of approaching concurrency. Also, it would be great if we could avoid some of the traditional and the most difficult problems in concurrency. And hopefully it's, a, it's something that can be used flexibly and in a number of different types of scenarios. So, I mentioned we had a couple, couple of, of talented engineers on our team who, who rose to the challenge. And one of the things that always scares me is when you let the engineers name the, name the, the project. It's kind of a code name, so anyway, that they named the project polycephaly. It's not contagious. But polycephaly actually means many heads, so actually it, it, it makes some good sense here. And it was an experiment that was done by engineering. And what it does is allow you to very easily facilitate starting up multiple headless images, handing them work, and getting the results. So, engineering it again and, and, and produced some usable versions of this and, <laughs> and handed it to me and said, here you go. Okay. Well, well, well now, well, one thing I want to point out is this is a, a simple, small talk, simple approach, hopefully, doing concurrency, we're, we're not saying we, you know, small talk has solved this decade-old problem of, of concurrency. It's all done. We, we solved it. We've, we've cured cancer. Uh, we haven't. So this is just uh, an approach that we hope is, uh, with, with minimal effort put in, uh, maximum benefits received. It's not a, there's no silver bullet for, for solving concurrency. What it is, is a simple, simple, effective framework. And for the set of problems that you can use it on, uh, I found it very effective. But I'd actually like uh, you folks to try it out, and, and you tell me, do you find this effective? And give us some feedback and direction as to where you'd uh, like to see this go in the future. Uh, Polycephaly will be, will be in preview with the uh, <coughs> coming release of the product. So I was given this code, okay, now what? Well, let me run some experiments on it. So what I wanted to do was, was find some code that performs a task and see if I could improve through throughput by using polycephaly. So I, I've been working with smallpox since 1986, so I used to work at an SE for for a park place back in the 90s, and one of the things I, I had was a number of examples of, of drawing and creating interactive stock charts. I had, I updated some of the code some years ago to, 
to go out and and, and find uh, data for for stocks and, and mutual funds and, and ETFs and, and create objects uh, uh, for those. So, so I found some code that would load load uh, information for stocks from a number of sources. <coughs> from mutual funds and from ETFs, and a lot of that we just go out online, grab it, parse it all, create the objects, and move on to the next. Um, so, so I had uh, sources from the New York Stock Exchange, the American Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, and at the mutual funds, actually there were a lot of mutual funds, there were, there were roughly 24,000 mutual funds. It was doing a significant amount of work, but it took a long time. And, and the code was even, was even, uh, it was just meant to be like a quick and dirty experiment that was, that was done with the code originally. So I wasn't going to go into the code and, and see how I could optimize it and refactor it. Not at all. Uh, I didn't look at most of the code. I just wanted to see, okay, here's some stuff. Can I use this new framework and can I do a better job with it? So basically, here's, here's literally the, the original sequential code. There's, there's a class called security. You can send a message, load, load NYSE, and it'll do just that. Uh, load Amex, load NASDAQ. I can say to the mutual fund class, load. I can say to the ETF, load. And, and I get, as a result of those, uh, all the loaded objects. So that is that is the original sequential code, and that took 114 seconds to execute. So, so almost two minutes that you're waiting for this to uh, to complete. Not a significant amount of time for this to happen. That's even some things. Uh, some of the some of the sources use names that had some abbreviations, so for some of it, I was doing additional calls out to, uh, out to Yahoo Finance and used their name instead, so a lot of stuff going on, but I didn't want to go try to optimize that. I wanted to try to use this tool to see what I could do with it. So my first experiment, take those five loads and try to make them work concurrently with using polycephaly. So first I had to uh, try to figure out a useful way with, with minimal impact of the code to make some changes that would allow me to, to load those concurrently. So I actually created a promise, and I'll show you the code for that in a moment. And the, the first five lines there create a promise that begins, that, that actually starts up a new headless image and, and gives, it, gives it the work that you see within the quotes there. Um, it immediately begins working on that, and if, if you're familiar how promises work, when you, they begin working immediately, and when you ask them for their value, they either give you the value that they have, they're, they're already done, or if they're, if it is not completed, you basically wait until they're done and then receive it. So the first five lines start the start the work working on, in this case, five separate headless images. And the bottom five will, will retrieve those values after they've completed. So it kind of syncs it all back up. So that was the first experiment. Well, here is the Here's the code I've created to create the promise. And you can see this is some of the code for using polycephaly. Virtual machine new. Let me create a new, start it up a new, a new headless image. That's all I had to do. And then you just tell the machine, do it. Here's what I want you to, here's the code I want you to execute. And then when you're done with that, you just tell the machine to release. And it, and it shuts down. And I created a promise with that and handed that back. So how did that do? Well, okay, nothing, nothing thrilling, nothing to jump up and down about. How many uh, processors did the machine have? 
My machine at that time was a dual core, <coughs> dual core CPU. And actually, I've since replaced that with a quad core and, and reran some of these. So, um, if I forget, remind me to tell you what the results for that, for that were uh, later on. This was experiment one, and it, it was it was pretty simple to do. Uh, pretty minimal changes to code, and and I got some improvement. Not a whole lot, but but some improvement. I guess if all I needed was was a little improvement, I'd be, I'd be uh, very satisfied with these results. But okay, we have to look under the covers and kind of go to the next level down and, and see what's going on. So uh, I ran basically time tests on, on each of those five things individually, and one thing kind of stood out, and that was my, my loading of my mutual funds took much longer than everything else. So, so that was my bottleneck. So if I really wanted to improve the overall time of this, I, I really should address, address that bottleneck. Well, one thing, when they say when you, when you have a hammer, everything, everything starts to look like a nail. So, of course, I went and looked at how was I getting the mutual funds, and the way the way the code did it was since there were lots of mutual funds, and the way the uh, the site where I was retrieving them, um, I couldn't get a list of all the mutual funds, but I could get I could get a list of all the mutual funds starting with A, all the funds starting with B, C, etc., all the way through Z. So we do an HTTP, HTTP call out for basically 26 calls. It would do. Well, 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 first of all, that's great. I've got 26 separate things, and I've got this this hammer. Let me let me create a number of. I can create 26 new machines and, and give each one a letter. And you go quite that crazy, but like I said, when you've got a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. So let's try making each letter an independent task. <clears throat> let's create a number of drone images, and I'll have each one grab a letter off the queue, process it, return the results. If there's any more letters to process, it'll grab the next one. So what would be the ideal number of drones? Well, let's, let's just create, let's, let's create a loop and let's, let's see which one works out the best. So I tested creating between 3 and 20 uh, extra images to do this processing, and here were the results in milliseconds. So you can see here, all of these were significant. Let's see, even even the worst case, I think, with three drones was was just a little over 30 seconds. So that was a significant improvement. Just, just that alone, even just just breaking it up into three pieces. But the sweet spot seems to be here. It's mostly linear, not, not perfectly, but the sweet spot here turned out to be eight drones, uh, around 17 and a half seconds. So by creating that eight drones and handing that out, <coughs> just mutual funds, not all the others, that might be another, another way to test it and, and do some optimization for, for how many should I create to approach this problem. But, so, so that would be a, a very significant improvement to addressing the bottleneck, right there. One thing I want to emphasize, when I was doing some of this work and discussing with the engineers, one of the engineers got a little upset with me, and, and it, was, it was a valid reason. One of the things he pointed out was, hey, in the real world, if you're using this tool, you're going to create drone images. You're going to create them and you're going to have them standing there waiting to do work. And in my tests, I'm including the startup time for every image in my, in my thing. And so it was a valid point, but, but I didn't want to try to game my numbers to try to come out with sensational results. I wanted to take a very conservative approach and see if I could still come up with significantly better results. So one thing to bear in mind, if you're, if you're you know, using a framework 
like this, or using this framework. You can, you can start up those images, say you're using this, and you start to create the master image and a number of drone images, and they stay up the whole time. So you wouldn't be paying for all this overhead every time, like I'm including in the, in the time measurement here. So that was a valid point, and I, wanna, I wanted to mention that. So, so a lot of my time <coughs> is, uh, and the results are, are very, very conservative. I didn't want to try to appear that I was gaming it to try to come out with sensational results. Yes, Christian. Um, that means that you basically do a call and get a return, and the machine shuts down afterwards. Is it possible to have it up and have multiple calls and multiple returns? Absolutely. And, and, that's exactly, and that was exactly the point. Yes, you, you could have a, a drone out there, start it up initially, and, and, and send it work, receive work, all, all day long. So you wouldn't be starting it up and, and shutting it down uh, like I was here. What it does is it uses, it starts up basically an instance of the same image of your original one, but, but not a copy, not a copy of, of your current one, but basically starts up another one of your original ones from from the file like you were starting up your original one for the first time. Yeah, so maybe you will show it later on, but did you try the same thing using Greenfresh with the same image? I mean, mm -hmm. but, you know, breaking the problem as you did with different VMs, but in the same VM using Greenfresh to, to see if there is a real difference there. I'll actually talk about one of the things I do with green threads. Uh, Obviously, okay. I'm coming right up. Okay, so this was, that last experiment significantly improved the time, about 80 seconds to 17 and a half seconds. But let's go back and take another look at the problem. Like I mentioned, when like you have a hammer, it looks like a nail. You, know, you want to use things appropriately not just indiscriminately. So we've got 26 HTTP calls, and, and here's another thing that, even if you've been doing the small talk forever, <coughs> sometimes you, you learn new things or you make assumptions that are, are incorrect. And in, in dis discussing the, this was a second conversation with, with one of our engineers, well, you know, suggesting some other things I might try, and, well, you know, my HTTP calls are, are essentially synchronous, and he said, no, they're not. They're not? No. Well, let me try something else. So I had 26 HTTP calls, and here's what that call looks like. The call in blue, the wait, a long wait for you to get a response, and this I haven't measured, this was the average. <coughs> This was the average amount of time, and then a relatively small amount for processing the results. So there was this huge time, uh, waste of time essentially, when you're just waiting and doing nothing. And the way this, the way this looked, here again the call is in the orange, the, the wait for the re response to that call is in white, and then the processing time in gray. So if I do all the A's, then all the B's, then all the C's, so I'm, I'm using, I'm including all, all the wait time for all of that with the work done in sequence. And that's the way it was working. What if we could overlap those weights? And it turns out from, from that discussion and in my incorrect assumptions that I could, I could simply fork off those HTTP calls using green threads and overlap all those weights. So now instead of that, that huge amount of time for each one, I just had basically, I, I basically had to wait for the process time. So I, I took that amount of time and, and compressed it basically to just overlapping the, the amount of time to process the resulting thing. So this was a, a, a big big improvement in speed. Uh, here was, uh, for the curious, here's actually the code. Um, having up to n, 
ten green threads. I get the, the next character, as long as there is one, and, and process that. And then signal that I'm, a signal a semaphore that it's complete. And I, I, fork off, I fork off n of those. And then at the bottom, we, we wait, wait, wait if there's excess signals, just goes right through. And if there's not a signal, like one of the processes is not completed, it will block. So that, that bottom line here says basically, don't go past here until, until everyone's done. So that's what it looked like. What were the results? Well, the results were that I used 13 green threads. And that reduced the load time to 15 seconds. So, so I didn't need to create all those images and fork out all that work just by using green threads here and overlapping all that wait time. I was able to do all of that in about 15 seconds in one image. And I went back and looked at this and said, well, why didn't I create 26 threads? And I, and I did. And it was a, a very, very small improvement, sub, less than a second. So didn't make too much difference. But again, I suppose if this was a large problem, I could also do some optimizations with how many, how many green threads to create that would be ideal for this. But uh, it was a very effective way to address this problem and, and using a relatively simple mechanism. So it wasn't going to get me into too much trouble. And all in one image. So, if I put that all together, what I did was I used Polycephaly to, to create five virtual machines and hand off the work. And one of those now, I handed off that job to create, the, to create all those green things. So I was basically combining both. You know, just distributing the work to a, a drone image and doing it that, with that, that, simpler, that simpler solution that was very effective. So what was the result of that altogether? I went from an original time of 114 seconds and dropped that down to 35 seconds. And this was just on a relatively old technology dual core machine. So this is, uh, this is over, over three times faster than made this with uh, relatively minimal changes. So for the for the requirements I had, I think this was was very effective. Pardon, use. Can I just clarify? You were saying 15 seconds for the single image, and now 35 seconds. Can you just explain? It sounds like 15 is less than 35. So, well, 15 seconds was for just loading mutual funds in an image in the green thread. This is the overall time for the entire. You know, yeah. for, for all five, all five loads uh, are going through. <coughs> so we're trying to do it all with green thread. Yeah, it did. They tried to do it all No, I did not. <laughs> um, there, there's the timing down from 114 seconds to 35 seconds. Um, I, I held off for a while rerunning the results because I basically built a new machine. I have a new, uh, it's a 3 gigahertz quad core machine. And in the last week before coming here, hopefully, let me rerun and just get a couple couple of timings. And the, the long time, the overall sequential time on the new machine was a, a new machine, a new machine with a quad core CPU. I had also upgraded in the meantime my, uh, my internet provider to, to an optical, so that was probably faster also. Instead of the 114 seconds, that went down to 72 seconds as a baseline. And then running it using polycephaly, took an overall time of 22 seconds. So, so roughly in the same it's between three and four times faster overall. So I'd like to make a few observations about, about this set of experiments. And that first, if, if, you're, if you're trying out this framework, Make sure you measure uh, the elapsed time of each piece. P people are, 
are, it's been shown in a number of studies, a lot of times we think we know where the bottlenecks are, or we think we know how much time is, is occurring in places, and, and often we do not. So, so we really want to see where the time is going and, and get, uh, you know, gather data so we can approach, approach solving it appropriately. And there's lots of ways to do concurrency and try to use appropriate ones. So in one experiment, I backed off using this, this great new tool that I was eager to use and, and found a simpler solution. And in the end, I actually ended up combining the two to, to come up with a, a superior solution. Um, strive for simplicity. And like I said, one of the requirements that I was really shooting for with this whole thing was keeping my approach to concurrency, small talk, simple, the KISS principle. When we say keep it, uh, keep it simple using small talk, or in this case, you keep it, keep it small talk simple. That was one of the, one of the goals for this, is to give you the, the maximum benefit for the minimum effort, the minimum number of problems, the minimal, uh, the smallest amount of growth and an exponential curve of, of difficulties you run into when uh, addressing the concurrency. Uh, some other observations. Uh, the, the launch of those headless drone images seemed much faster than I expected. They seemed to occur very quick. And again, no, I would probably have uh, significantly faster times if, if I didn't include the startup of those images in each one of these runs. All fast. <clears throat> I didn't measure the actual time, just, uh, just, just an observation, noting how quickly they started up and started that work. Three seconds or seconds? How long does it take to no, no. bring out an image? Oh, when you bring up an image on your machine, that's generally my benchmark. Headless. But these are headless, so that, that probably had a significant amount to do with it. But that was just, that was just a, 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 not measured, but just kind of a, a human observation. Uh, someone asked before that the drone images are oh, basically... Uh, this was on, on Windows Vista. Because that's very important. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And actually, the start of time, I mean, probably if, I, if I'm going to do this uh, in a commercial fashion, I'm going to I'm going to start them at the beginning of the day and and leave them running. So it's largely a non-issue. Uh, uh, my measurements were were conservative because I included that startup time, and I was I was very very pleased with the amount of refinement. It seemed that in many years, and Michael, Michael here was, was, uh, was one of the two engineers involved, and it seemed to have a lot of forethought, like a lot of time went into making this interface very simple and very effective, and some forethought. There were a number of little refinements that were, were more than I expected for the initial uh, the, the initial code that was delivered. Uh, for example, okay, like what? If, uh, if you created a, a dozen drone images to, to do work, and you lost the references for them, so you didn't shut them down, are you going to be sitting there killing, killing all these images? No. When you shut down your main images, it, auto it, it, it keeps references and automatically shuts down all those other images. If on that other machine, one of those other virtual machines, it runs into an error, you can retrieve that error through the results. So you can react to that, rerun it, or do something else. Do you communicate between the images? Is this open uh, Pipes, I believe. Not to shake your head, Michael. Pipes? Pipes. Pipes would actually boss, up, boss the objects to communicate them over the, over the pipes. What about exceptions? The end, the price is an exception. Does the other VM get the exception or just uses the connection? You can retrieve the exception through the interface. Oh, okay. That was one of the refinements. 
as you got Michael. Uh, 
Uh, spread all those out would have required more significant changes to the code, which is one of the things I was trying to avoid altogether. And I just had it with, with, uh, with brief threads that, that that definitely took care of the HTTP call weight problem. But in overall processing, uh, there was definite benefit to spreading it out to, to multiple images. Um, I have a question. I saw that the, that the code uh, which you spawned was in the string. So I guess that refactoring doesn't work anymore so for that code. Actually, that was one of the, I think, some feedback. Help you, Michael, here in a minute. Um, some of the feedback we got, we got some suggestions. I was looking for one of the people. Um, about maybe using uh, symbols instead of strings or, or doing that differently so that we can still use some of the tools. Um, and I think you made those changes in the, in the latest version, Michael, or experimented with that. Can you recall? You can use full box. That was just the initial, so we already made some refinements based on some of the feedback, and that was a, a good suggestion, a good observation. Actually, I had a question up here first. Are you looking at anything for a link style after? Erlang's Erlang's using uh, a very a very effective model for for what they do. Um, even looking at some of the Erlang stuff, there seems to be some disconnect as to trying to use that style in small talk. I mean, the, 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 one of the guiding principles I think of Erlang is say share nothing. And if we've got objects, it's almost like well, we share everything. So I'm not, I'm not sure how you'd effectively do that. Uh, I think if uh, it were that simple, you might have been able to figure out a better approach already. Is this working? We just start talking about it. Yeah, I just wanted to share a couple of things that, uh, that, that I found. Uh, actually, uh, while doing some other experiments that were related to this. And um, one thing I wanted to, to comment on was that indeed the numbers you present can't be conserved because when, and this is just an FYI for people that do this, that they might find this useful. When you have many green threads running at the same time, uh, particularly uh, with uh, VisualWorks VM, there's a native stack somewhere where all the messages and frames are stored. If you have many green threads running at the same time, the native uh, stack, uh, the space allocated for that, will not be enough for all the processes running. And so some comments will be thrown off into the new space, and then we'll have many garbage collected, etc. Depending on what you're doing, according to the measurements I made, you can get a speed improvement of 10x, literally, just by increasing the native stack size of all your processes fit there. Uh, so that's something to, to keep in mind when, when running these things with uh, green press and, and whatnot. Uh, measurements are, are, are a great thing. <coughs> the other thing that I um, wanted to perhaps uh, raise awareness to is that let's say that you're running many images and it's not just the, the, the amount of memory that you use in the box, but um, for example, GC is, is as everybody knows, it's very memory intensive, and if you <laughs> happen to have a lag and all of your threads decide to do something with GC at the same time, um, processes, processors these days run very quickly when everything fits on cache. But <laughs> if you're running GC, there's there's no cache that will cope with that. So that's something to keep in mind when designing these this kind of solutions. Something that can be important for performance. I just want to bring it up. Thank you. Other, oh, did you have a question? I just, I just want to um, uh, comment on the whole uh, principle because that little small company which uh, uses those little <coughs> chips there, AMD, um, which by the way are which by the way are manufactured with uh, 650 visual works images in Dresden. Um, uh, this company has, a, has a applied the same principle of optimization to their testing tool. So they have a, have a test tool of uh, roughly something like three and a half thousand tests. And if they run them, it took them almost an hour to run the whole test tool. And 
they were not satisfied with that one time because they wanted to run them uh, individually uh, and in a more faster way. Uh, so one guy sat down and used open talk to make use of all the other machines they had available in their testing department. And they have got something like eight processing machines. Um, and uh, using open talk and um, some framework he built on his own, he was able to distribute the tests <coughs> over several images. So he used, I think, eight images. That was something like a good, uh, a good starting point. And the images captured <coughs> Um, 10 tests or something like 20 tests and run them and then look if there are still tests to, to be uh, run. And so it's almost the same framework which they, which they use. Um, they only wrote it themselves. Yeah, I think Hydrox was big during my studio, but I still have to be with you. Oh, and by the way, the tests are through in 10 minutes then. Yeah? So set up this uh, new code, uh, press the button, and uh, go have some coffee, and, and, and adapt it with food. So they had a big improvement by using that. And they're not all, not all tests are strictly idle bound. So it's really the benefit of uh, distributing the code execution. Thanks. Thank you. So I think I want to more, more, make more ask your opinion about two uh, comments on it. So when I was here for the last <coughs> time, 25 years ago, that was the time of new research. Or I was here at the university researching dual, dual processor hardware for smaller AD. And in those days, we had one processor dedicated to the, uh, to the screen and to, the, to, the, to that stuff. It was the 68,000. And we had a second processor, the 68,010 to do that. And at those times, there were competitions. Who has the fastest VM and won? For a short period of time. <laughs> <laughs> before risk. And um, so it is very important to have, that's what, what the research said in abstract. It's very important how you distribute the work and how far you do the bandwidth between the processes. How, how many activities can you do at a time before you need to synchronize? None of the queues may overrun, but none of the queues may run down, etc., etc. So there, a lot of fine tuning was going on, and that was all that had to be done in the same way. Um, and C, which is not very different. And the second comment I want to make shortly after that, uh, we were a distributor of Jensen, and I had just happened to sit in the middle of it. And in those days, when we were distributing it, on the literature it said, if you want to scale, use symmetric multiprocessor systems. Actually, technically, this reminds me of, uh, um, of multi-core systems of today. That was 15 years ago. Could you comment on the Jensen architecture also? How does it, does it fit in your the do you want to do that? Does it fit in your alternatives? Uh, I would suggest we can take that up. I'm not familiar enough to comment directly on our architecture, okay. but um, <laughs> suggest <laughs> Take that offline? Yeah, I think that's on. Okay, last one. Uh, just uh, picking up on the question in here of architecture about uh, processors being more available in space, the Capital architecture, of course, is a very well worked out um, distributed architecture. They have images that often are 500 megabytes uh, in size and they use the shared memory approach that you described. Uh, and in their case, yes, they're, they're invariably finding that processors are less available than memory, so they're kind of grabbing every single machine they have. And I think I would agree with Georg, therefore, that uh, in, in that very real, very large experiment, yeah, space is cheaper than time. Okay, thank you very much.